Good day. As before, I'm just going to proceed this video with a short announcement about our um, programming on Rumble. If you're watching this program on Rumble, where an increasing number of our videos are now appearing on Rumble's homepage, you can go to the top of this video and see a red maroon button there which you can press and that will take you directly to our locals page where we publish lots of exclusive content and where we have a thriving community which you can join if you wish. You can also find me on Rumble by typing Alexander Mercurius on the search bar and of course uh, the Duran is also there on Rumble as of course is Alex Christophorou's channel Alex Christophorou my friend and colleague we where who uh, uh, does the Duran with me so with that let's proceed to the latest update on the situation in Ukraine and I think before we do that I think there's a point I do want to clarify about the Russian announcements about troop deployments which took place on Tuesday that famous meeting between Putin and Defence Minister Shoigu which I think has been widely misreported especially in the West media. Uh, the, the, way the, the way that meeting is being spun, the way that particular announcement is being spun, is that Shoigu and Putin agreed to withdraw troops, Russian troops, from Ukraine's borders. And the um, argument that we're now hearing from Western governments, or at least to be more precise, from the US, and British governments is that this withdrawal is a fake. Those troops aren't being redeployed from the borders at all. More troops are in fact heading to the border. And even though there wasn't an invasion of Ukraine on Tuesday or on an invasion of Ukraine on Wednesday, that invasion could happen imminently or anytime soon or any day or any time over the next couple of months. Yes, there was an article by Liz Truss British Foreign Secretary in the Daily Telegraph, which actually said that this could go on for months. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, for the record, Shoigu and Putin did not announce any withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine's borders. What Shoigu did, and something he does regularly, he does this several times a year, and he has do done this regularly over uh, the course of several uh, years, he reports to Putin on the progress of military exercises. It's a standard uh, uh, for Russian television to film this report. Lots of Russians, lots of uh, 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 serve in the Russian armed forces. Many Russian families are keen to know what their sons and daughters are doing who are serving in the military. So this is you know, important news in Russia. Shoigu reported to Putin on the progress of military and naval exercises around Russia, but specifically in Belarus and in Crimea. And he confirmed Putin that those exercises are now winding down. We've always known, the Russians have always said, that the end date for the exercises in Belarus is the 20th of February, which is, of course, Sunday. And he informed Putin that with the exercises starting to wind down, some of the troops who participated in those exercises are returning to their permanent barracks, which, of course, they were always scheduled to do. So this is not, as I said, a withdrawal announcement per se, and nor is it a fake withdrawal announcement as some governments in the West are trying to claim. It is simply Shoigu reporting to Putin about the progress of regular exercises of a kind that Russia repeatedly engages in at various times of the year in various parts of Russian territory. Now, there's a link under this video to Shoigu's report to Putin. And if you read it carefully, that all becomes entirely clear. 
Now, where are we? There was no invasion of Ukraine on Wednesday. There was no invasion of Ukraine on Tuesday. There was any doubt before as to who has been driving this story about a Russian invasion. It's now become blindingly clear that it is the United States and Britain. Because instead of welcoming the what they spun as this Russian withdrawal announcement on Tuesday, they claimed instead that the withdrawal announcement is a fake and that this agenda for starting an invasion of Ukraine is still, uh, uh, there's still a possibility, or at least not even a possibility, but a likelihood. The United States and Britain are still running with this story, even as doubts about it on independent media, on social media, are now starting to proliferate, even as Western governments in Europe are beginning to become increasingly sceptical and one suspects deep down increasingly angry about the way in which this uh, story is being um, uh, dominating the headlines, is being constantly promoted in that way. And as a result, we also starting to see a certain amount of pushback. There was uh, meetings both of the European Council and of NATO um, over the course of the last few days. NATO, the NATO meeting in particular, was supposed to result in important announcements. Jens Stoltenberg has been promoting the idea of deploying battle groups to Eastern Europe. But clearly, there's been some pushback from some quarters because he wasn't able, in fact, to announce that. He actually had to admit that no final decision on the formation of these battle groups has been made. So clearly there are some people in NATO, some countries in NATO, which are becoming increasingly exasperated with all of this. And one that suspects this is also true about the European Union as well, because it's become clear over the last couple of days that despite all the brave talk about agreements on sanctions, the issue of sanctions is still being negotiated. There is still considerable resistance from all sorts of quarters, uh, within Europe especially, there has been pushback against sanctions announcements. We've now had, as we've seen, acceptance, universal acceptance, that disconnecting Russia from SWIFT is an incredibly bad idea, but it now turns out that European banks are informing their governments that they're not keen on any of the sanctions which are being floated against uh, Russian financial institutions, and that they even want to continue trading in Russian sovereign debt, at least in the secondary debt markets. That, by the way, is remarkable. And it does rather suggest that European banks at least don't believe that an invasion of Ukraine is being planned in Moscow and don't want to be pushed into a position where their governments commit to doing something uh, um, which might never be needed because of worry on the part of European banks that if those kind of commitments are indeed made, then that might result in steps being taken in Ukraine to make those threats of those sorts of sanctions actually happen. So, as I said, there's pushback. Interestingly enough, there's also increasing signs of exhaustion and disillusion in Ukraine itself. Wednesday, the 16th of February, um, which is, as I said, supposed to be Invasion Day, and may I say in parenthesis that the Americans and the British are now denying that they ever said officially that Wednesday, the 16th of February, would be Invasion Day. But the reality is that, of course, all their officials were fanning across the media, telling everybody informally that the invasion would indeed happen, at least this week and probably on Wednesday or possibly on Tuesday. So the Western governments are pretending, uh, British and American governments are pretending 
that these days didn't come from them. It's quite clear that they ultimately did. There's even a report, which by the way I believe, that in that conference call with European leaders on Friday, Biden actually named either Tuesday or Wednesday of this week as the day when he expected the Russian invasion of Ukraine to take place. Anyway, regardless, all this talk about invasion is starting to create some pushback in Ukraine itself. And perhaps in some ways the most significant, not the most important, but the most significant event that took place on Wednesday 16th February was the failure of Ukrainians to attend in any number the protests that were being promoted by the Ukrainian government and by Western officials, the mass protests which were supposed to show defiance to the Russians in the face of the threat of invasion. Even Western media outlets like The Guardian were forced to admit that the attendance was desultory. And The Guardian actually reported that at one point there seemed to be more, more journalists covering the protest in Maidan Square than there were protesters actually present on that square. So the attendance was extraordinarily thin and for the record, most of the people who did attend appear to have been President Zelensky's supporters, people affiliated in some cases with the far right in Ukraine, the sort of people who are strongly opposed to any kind of rapprochement with Russia, the people who within Ukraine itself have been driving the confrontation with Russia ever since the protests, the Maidan protests in Ukraine began in 2013. And I can't help but feeling feel that what the attempt to stage these protests in Ukraine has ended up doing is shown the extent to which these far-right people are now becoming increasingly isolated from the great mass of the Ukrainian population which has become exhausted and cynical by all this talk of war and which has basically lost whatever belief it may once have had in the prospects of a better outcome for Ukraine from the great turn to the West that took place as a result of the Maidan events in 2014. So this was, I think, a major political and psychological blow and it may also have strengthened the pressure that there clearly now is. Ukrainian officials have apparently, off the record, been confirming this. There's been apparently renewed threat pressure from the French and the Germans, who clearly don't want to be pushed into a position where they have a breakdown of relations with Russia and are forced to take action like imposing sanctions and cancelling Nord Stream 2 that they don't want to take. There's apparently increasing pressure from the French and the Germans on the Ukrainians to start working towards fulfilling the terms of the Minsk II agreement. And I discussed in the programme I did yesterday about Olaf Scholz's visit to Moscow, how he managed to squirrel in during his press conference with Putin, the revelation that the Ukrainians are now going to come up with draft proposals for autonomy and local government in the Donbass and that they will be um, provided to the tripartite contact group at which the representatives of Donetsk and Lugansk in which, uh, participate before they're put to the Ukrainian parliament for possible ratification. So that does increasingly look like a move orchestrated or pressured upon Ukraine by the French and Germans to achieve some kind of forward movement on Minsk II. We will see whether that works. And already, as I've discussed before, there are already cries, especially from Britain, 
about appeasement, about uh, Munich, about all of those things uh, floating up to the surface. If there's a deal done, by the way, I suspect that before very long, especially if Germany is obviously involved in it, we'll be hearing more lurid talk uh, conjuring up the ghosts of Molotov and Ribbentrop from 1939 and all that. So perhaps be ready for this in advance. And perhaps a further sign that things are now starting to shift in Ukraine itself is that Zelensky himself has now come out and said that the commitment by Ukraine to join NATO, which has been embedded in Ukraine's constitution, should never have been made in that way. There should first have been a referendum to decide it. I seem to remember, by the way, that this was at one time something that was actually even promised, that previous Ukrainian governments actually said that before any commitment to join NATO was ever made by Ukraine, there would be a national referendum to decide that issue. Well, Zelensky's comments about this could be seen as an attempt to try to mobilise Ukrainian support for NATO membership. Though, by the way, on the latest opinion polls, it's far from overwhelming. Or it could be seen as a way to backtrack from that commitment to join NATO. More likely the latter, or so it seems to me. And anyway, we shall see how this goes. And it could be that this is also part of some sort of negotiation that is underway. But in the meantime, as I said, the British and the French are continuing to plug away at this story about the Russian invasion of Ukraine that's always imminent, but which never happens. And um, we've got more news that the exodus from Kiev continues. The embassy in Kiev, the US embassy in Kiev, apparently has been entirely evacuated. Apparently all the computer programs, all the computers and all the equipment there has been destroyed, which is a remarkable thing to do, by the way. And um, I understand there's been reports that the CIA station in Kiev has also been evacuated and everything now is being relocated to the western Ukrainian city of Lviv in the region formerly known as Galicia, which is the most passionate anti-Russian region in Ukraine and one which of course borders on Poland and on other countries of the EU. And I've floated in my previous video the possibility that the plan is eventually to allow most of Ukraine to quietly collapse or collapse into Russia's hands to set up some kind of government in Lviv to get the government, in fact, the Ukrainian government relocated to Lviv and to insist, of course, that this is the true Ukrainian government and whatever entity falls under Russian control in the rest of Ukraine is somehow illegitimate. And perhaps at that point to get this core region, or at least this rump region of Ukraine, it's not Ukraine's core region, maybe to get that incorporated into NATO, even as the rest of Ukraine is presumably abandoned to the Russians. And by the way, there are reports today, admittedly reports coming out of Donetsk and Lugansk, the two people's republics there, um, which perhaps should not be taken as entirely reliable, or at least at all, as at all reliable. Though I would say that the authorities in Donetsk and Lugansk have shown in the past that they're actually quite well informed about things which are going on in Kiev, which suggests either that they're being fed intelligence by the Russians or that they have their own uh, sources of intelligence in Kiev itself. But apparently there are reports coming out of Donetsk and Lugansk that there are indeed now 
active plans underway to relocate the entire Ukrainian government to Lviv, to move the ministries, the officials, all of them from Kiev to Lviv, in effect abandoning uh, Kiev, abandoning central Ukraine and eastern Ukraine, and for what it's worth, perhaps even the military in, uh, uh, in, uh, on the contact line, unless the plan is to withdraw that military to Lviv, to western Ukraine as well. I would add that if I think any attempt like that is made, the desertions will be on an enormous scale, and the formations that will indeed be withdrawn intact to western Ukraine will probably be very few. Probably the notorious Azov battalion and a few formations like that. I think the most of the Ukrainian army, if it's ordered to retreat in that kind of fashion, would probably simply collapse. Anyway, that might be the plan. I don't know. But whatever, it certainly seems as if even as some Western governments, notably those of Germany and France, continue to look for ways to settle this conflict through the Minsk agreement processes and are looking to find some way to get out of this commitment to, uh, 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 that has been made, this very foolish and unwise commitment which was made to admit uh, Ukraine into NATO, that they're still looking for some kind of way out of this in order to avoid having to impose sanctions on Russia, something which they absolutely do not want to do, um, even as the French and the Germans are trying to engineer that. Other countries, notably Britain and the United States, at the moment seem to be pursuing a radically different agenda which looks like trying to create some kind of crisis in Ukraine and with some indications now that they might even be looking in some kind of way to collapse the central and eastern parts of the country into Russia's hands. The idea, I suppose, would in that case to leave a kind of vacuum which the Russians might feel obliged to fill and to spin that as some kind of invasion, and then to put the pressure on the French and the Germans to impose sanctions. I accept that it's all very, very speculative, but this flight from Kiev is very difficult to explain in any other set, in any other way. And um, I, I am, if anyone else could come up with an alternative explanation that makes sense, uh, perhaps they could tell me what it is. I would add that even if there is a threat of a Russian invasion of Ukraine, the abandonment of Kiev in this kind of way is, gives a disastrous impression. After all, when Kabul fell, the Taliban didn't storm the US or Western embassies in Kabul. So why assume that the Russians would do the same in Kiev? It seems all but inconceivable that that danger actually exists. Anyway, there we are. I would make one, a few further, one further, a few further points. Firstly, all of this, all of this tension, is already having severe economic impacts around the world. One of them is that there's been a sharp rise in the oil price um, up to the moment of the Russian announcement of the drawdown of troops from the exercise in Belarus and Crimea. Uh, Ural's crude, which is one of the, um, one of the um, types of oil which is internationally traded, Ural's crude was trading as one, at $100 a barrel. And um, other um, types of crude oil, Brent crude, um, all the others, they are all of them, as of, as of now, trading at over $90 a barrel. Some of them are significantly higher than this. We're very, very close to a situation when the oil price finally hits $100 a barrel and stays there and possibly even goes north 
of that number. The implications for household bills in Europe and in the United States, perhaps, uh, um, you know, is something people ought to be considering because it's going to have major repercussions, I would have thought, on living standards. And it was striking that President Biden, in his latest comments about the crisis, actually seemed to be warning people that higher energy prices are on the way. Um, might be worth considering what the implications of all this war scare are. If they are already having an effect on inflationary pressures, they're leading to rises in energy costs, which are going to be transmitted all around the world. And of course, particularly vulnerable here is Europe. As we all know, Europe imports around 40% of its natural gas from Russia. What many people don't know is that it also imports around a quarter of its crude oil from Russia as well. Russia is Europe's biggest supplier of crude oil. If that is interrupted, it would, be, it would have major repercussions on the European energy system just as interruptions of natural gas prices, uh, 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 natural gra gas uh, from Russia would also have major implications for the European energy situation. I would add that this rise in oil and gas prices is currently providing significant strengthening to the Russian financial position. One other effect of this particular geopolitical crisis is that it is depressing the value of the ruble. The ruble ought to be rising in value with the oil, at, with the oil price. Instead, it has been, if anything, falling slightly. So that means that the Russians are able to produce oil and gas cheaply at depressed rubles and get paid for it in constantly appreciating prices, which are, of course, priced, in the case of crude, in dollars. So for the Russians, this is creating an extraordinary financial bonanza, which, of course, again, is not being reported. We haven't received the most recent reports about the state of Russian foreign currency reserves as a result of the, work, of the events of the last couple of weeks. But I, for one, would not be surprised if we see them jump. And if we are not seeing them jump, that's almost certainly because the Russian government is working with Russian corporates to redistribute funds provided from the sales of gas and oil to Russian corporates to provide them with foreign currency to shield them further from any further sanctions risks going down the line. But regardless, the Russians are obviously gaining a considerable financial bonanza from all of this, something which I've noticed is not being reported in the West. And, of course, not just the Russians, but all the oil producers. Um, people like Maduro in Venezuela, people like MBS in Saudi Arabia, are all doing financially extremely well out of this crisis at the moment. And, of course, the other effect that all of this is happening is that it's drawing, keeping attention away from other things. And we've been hearing an awful lot about the Russian build-up in Europe, mythological, though I suspect that actually is, and that has distracted attention from the very real Russian build-up, which is currently underway in Syria. The Russians have now redeployed more Tupol F-22 M3 heavy bombers to their air base at Khmeimim in Syria. This is a very heavily enlarged air base that the Russians have been expanding ever since they entered Syria in 2015. It now has two runways. And um, these 22, Tupolev 22 M3 bombers 
are of course equipped with very powerful KH-23 um, um, supersonic um, anti-ship missiles um, able to contest uh, US and NATO naval dominance of the Mediterranean and they'll also be supple supplemented with uh, MiG-23 uh, supersonic uh, fighter bombers which are equipped with Kinjal hypersonic missiles, the kind of missiles that are also intended to be launched against aircraft carriers and other f facilities. Now, this does change the military balance in the Mediterranean. I've discussed this some months ago in another video. It means that the Mediterranean is no longer the NATO lake, which it has been basically ever since the Second World War, and that the Russians are now in a position to provide serious military challenges to NATO fleets operating in the Mediterranean. And again, I think that the importance of the Mediterranean is often um, little understood. Not only does it threaten NATO's soft underbelly, um, places like Italy, Greece, the Balkans, um, southern France and wherever, but more importantly, the Mediterranean is a critically important sea route for commodities, oil, for example, from the Gulf to come to Europe, and not just oil, but all sorts of products. It, they, they come by container ship or tanker into the Mediterranean via the Suez Canal, and that's how an awful lot of Europe's foreign trade is um, conducted. And the Russians have now established a very powerful air base in Syria, equipped with extremely potent weapons and aircraft, which is standing or sitting on top of this vitally important trade route, able conceivably at some point to take action with respect to it. And to give an idea of how important this deployment of forces to Syria is, the Russian Defence Minister, Sergei Shoigu, has just been to Syria, he's toured the base, he's spoken to the various people there. I understand he's had a meeting with President Assad, so Shoigu has been in Syria. Notice that he has been in Syria rather than in Moscow plotting his great invasion of Ukraine. And it's fascinating to see how, with all the focus on Ukraine, these Russian deployments in Syria have gone almost completely unreported in the media. Well, where is this all going? As I'm making this video, there's been reports of more shelling in the Donbass. And some people are wondering whether this is the moment that the great confrontation in the Donbass is going to begin, whether this is going to be the trigger of the Russian invasion or counter-invasion or whatever. It's possible. I have to say that the initial reports speak of heavy exchanges of fire, but they do not suggest deployment by of heavy artillery to any great degree. Most of the fighting seems to have been uh, uh, cases of mortar fire and uh, exchanges of rocket-propelled grenades and things like this. This is uh, reasonably short-range weapon systems. Uh, it looks more like exchanges of fire across the contact line as opposed to any major attempt by either side to prepare for some big offensive there. If we start to see heavy artillery being used in quantity, there was one report that one particular um, gun, a 122mm gun, was fired, but that's only one gun. If we start to see heavy artillery being used in quantity, then that will be a much more serious sign. These exchanges of fire that we're hearing at the moment look to me to be a particularly bad case, a particularly worrying case of the sort of thing that goes on all the time and perhaps should not be seen as too 
especially threatening in themselves. In saying that, I want to reiterate, there is no grounds for complacency. The situation in the Donbass looks extremely grim. But I also have to say that I can't imagine that the morale of Ukrainian troops is particularly high. All the indications from all the reports that I read before in the media, in the Western media, suggested otherwise. And with Kiev emptying, with the US pulling out its advisors, with the British pulling out its advisors, I would have thought that Ukrainian morale would have fallen even further. And that doesn't seem to me to point to an army which is preparing for an attack, which it must know can only result in its own destruction. So I doubt that there will be a Ukrainian attack on the Donbass. And since it seems to me that the Russians have no wish to launch an attack on the Ukrainians, it seems to me that most likely the, this, these, ex these exchanges of fire are a sign of tension and nervousness on both sides. They're not an indicator that a war is about to start. So we'll see how long this goes. It seems to me that it's a case of waiting for one of three outcomes. Either the Germans and the French manage to broker this deal to get Minsk to reactivated and find some way of e eliding this commitment that NATO so foolishly made to include Ukraine into NATO. In other words, the French and the Germans find some way of, in effect, agreeing to Moscow's wishes. That's one possibility. Possibility two is that some kind of battle begins in the Donbass, the Russians re react, we have the sanctions imposed, and at that point, um, Nord Stream 2 goes, but everything remains in all other respects as was. Sanctions are imposed, there's a major crisis, but I suspect once the dust has settled, it will be clear that in fact very little has actually changed on the ground. Possibility three is that Ukraine, eastern and central Ukraine, are abandoned. Um, there's some kind of collapse there. The Russians perhaps feel drawn in. We don't quite know how they would react in that kind of situation. And some kind of new government is created in Lviv, which the NATO powers then recognise as the proper government of Ukraine. Well, that seems to me it's one of those three possibilities that we're looking at. We'll see which one it is. Anyway, thank you for joining me today. There'll be more from me soon. Uh, no doubt about this and other issues. I'm sure like all of you, <laughs> I'm getting a little tired with all of this, but with the British and the Americans apparently intent on keeping this hysteria going. It looks as if this thing is going to drag on for several more weeks, perhaps months, as Liz Trust said. We shall see how it all goes. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon. You can join us on the Duran, where I do programmes with Alex Christoforou, my friend and colleague. You can ch ch check out, by the way, his own channel. You can join me here on my channel. You can join my channel on Rumble, as I said at the start of this programme. You can join the, this channel on Locals, where we have our very active page, where, as I said, you can you, all sorts of exclusive content is published and where we have a thriving community, which you're very welcome to join. We're present on other platforms as well, including the new free speech platform, Super You. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. And of course, you can go to our shop and buy the various things, the wonderful things you will find there. Our mugs, our t-shirts, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to uh, you joining me again soon. Please remember to tick the like button if you've liked this video. Please also check your subscription to this channel. More from me soon. 
and have a very good day until then.